Professor Ward Churchill talks about the history of government-created American Indian residential schools. He wrote about them in his book titled, Kill the Indian, Save the Man. Save the Man. City Lights booksellers in San Francisco hosted the two-hour talk. Really glad to have Ward Churchill here tonight, and we always are, but um, I have to say that this evening is a long time coming. We're here tonight um, to talk about specifically, I'm sure more things, but um, Ward's latest book that we published at City Lights is called Kill the Indian, Save the Man, and this book was published at the end of 2004. Um, we had planned that Ward would be here speaking about this book in January of 2005, but around January 2005 is when Ward became the topic du jour for Bill O'Reilly, and it was a long time before Ward was ever actually going to be able to come here and speak about anything other than that. Um, I'm sure that that weighs on some of what might you, you might want to hear about tonight, but um, I'm going to pretty much leave it up to Ward about what he wants to speak about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book just to give you some context. Um, the book is about the impact of the American Indian Residential School Program on the Native American community. And um, Ward outlines that in a very comprehensive manner here. And basically this book to me, um, and Ward can tell you more about this, this book is part of a long go ongoing project of Ward's to talk about the fact that what happened in this country is classified, should be classified, as genocide against Native American populations. And it's an attempt to construct that language um, and deconstruct the obfuscation of that language that's gone on for so long. And to historically and legally make the case that um, under the legal definition of genocide, all of these different aspects of what happened throughout the history of the founding and formation and continuation of the United States definitely is a crime against these people. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what's in the book. So um, beginning with a definition of the crime of genocide and um, talking about how what happened in the schools qualifies as part of that definition of genocide. And then it goes through, um, it's a basically one long essay telling about the conditions in the schools and how they affected the children and the families. Um, there are a bunch of different categories, the forced transfer of children, destroying the national pattern of the oppressed group, imposing the national pattern of the oppressor, the slow death measure of starvation, indirect killing by disease, the slow de death measure of forced labor, torture and predation. These are all the things that these young children had to face and that's what they brought out into their lives and into their families and it's generation by generation the kind of post-traumatic stress that people manifest and that also goes out and ripples out into the community from people who've been through a horrifying situation. So all of that makes this a very difficult book to read in some ways. Um, it's very sad. Uh, it's also full of information that I think is really important for people to understand. Um, this program actually continued into the 1980s, which a lot of people don't really can't even imagine that that could be true. Um, and the effects of it continue on today. So with that, I'll leave you and introduce Ward Churchill. I'm all, uh, one last thing I wanted to say is that we're very glad to have C-SPAN here filming tonight. And one, I suppose you could call benefit of what Ward has been put through is that uh, there is this amount of interest in what he has to say. And so there's a possibility that on evenings like this, um, the information and, and perspective that Ward brings actually is going to make it out into the living rooms of a lot more people than can actually be at one of his readings. So I'm really glad that that's happening tonight. One result of that is that um, there's a few protocol issues because of the filming. So the little pieces of paper that you have on your chairs are for questions. And while Ward's speaking, um, or hope very soon after, I'll be up here, and if you could just pass things through the audience, um, I'll be collecting questions here and sort of putting them together, um, and that's the way we're going to have to do the question and answer period afterwards, since we don't, we haven't set up with mics for the filming. So if you'd um, help with that, and be sure to write clearly so I can read your questions. Okay, so Ward will speak for a while, and then afterwards we'll have the Q&A. Thanks.
Ocio, Ocio. Hello, Marilatus. Can you hear me? That's where we start. Move over to the left. The mics are not on. I'm going to try to carry the room without a mic. I need to stay near the mic for the cameras. So, despite the fact that I have this array of microphones, there will be no amplification. Okay? I'm going to try to compress what usually in a public lecture comes to about an hour and a half's worth of talk into roughly 45 minutes so that we have some time to interact. So I'm going to be skimming. I'm also going to be speaking fairly rapidly. I guess I should preface everything by giving appropriate thank you to Bill O'Reilly for the reasons that Elaine mentioned. Uh, I'm not sure I could have bought that kind of publicity. Wouldn't have scripted it quite that way, but P.T. Barnum had it right, apparently. It's good to be here talking about something besides that, however. Although, what I'm going to be talking about, as was already indicated, is anything but pleasant. In fact, although I pursued the theme of genocide in my work and in my research for the past 20 years and change, this is the hardest thing by far I ever wrote. And it's hard for me to go back and read, so I'm not going to read. I'm going to talk. And I'm going to talk about a bunch of things that are interwoven in a complex of American history. Beginning with the fact that in the course of my career, my writing, my activist work, I've been in a lot of places other than this talking in institutions, talking in political fora, talking with government leaders and so on. And this is the one country that I've encountered, third world, second world, first world, this country, and to a lesser extent Canada, North America in general. That's the location where I find the least understanding of the term genocide. In fact, an absolute caricature of the term. And I don't think that happened by accident. It's not a very old word. It was coined in 1944 by Raphael Lemkin. Now, 44 may seem like a long time ago to some people in a room, but I was born three years after it, so it doesn't seem like ancient history to me. And for a word to have been absolutely voided of its original meaning in that short a period of time is little short of phenomenal, unless there is a concerted and usually official effort to distort meaning. What you get here, insofar as you have any comprehension at all of the connotation of the term, is that it's somehow or another a synonym with killing, killing on a particular scale, killing by a particular mode, killing usually in the form that's symbolized or signified by Auschwitz. And it's not. The word was coined to, as the coiner stated, imply any policy undertaking with the intent to bring about the dissolution and disappearance of a targeted human group as such. Now, real important, you pay attention to that word that came before as such. It's the group that's at issue. It's not the individuals in the group. You can have a genocide, at least hypothetically, I doubt you'd ever find a concrete example of this, but hypothetically, at least, you could have a genocide consummated without a single individual in the target group being killed. It is not a synonym for killing. And Lemkin was at great pains to make that clear. It's a fairly complicated explanation of all this that would be possible, but I'm not going to go there because time is short. What I'm going to do is simply cut to the chase, that you have an articulation of the meaning of genocide in international law under the 1948 Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, second article of which delineates five criteria that express those policy tra trajectories that add up to genocide. And they're in fairly general terms. They require a little extrapolation in most cases to be applied, but they're fairly clear. The first one has to do with killing members of a target group. You can, of course, bring about dissolution and disappearance by killing. Lemkin was an expatriate Polish Jew writing about Nazi occupation policy in Europe. He was fully cognizant of what the Nazis were doing to his own people. 
was a little off in his numbers, but the numbers that he was being off with were the numbers that were being used by the World Jewish Congress at the time. So he had an appreciation of the magnitude and the approach it was being taken, and he was still quite careful to set it aside. This is one way you can get at it, all right? It's by no means the only way. Killing members of a targeted group simply by virtue of their membership in a group is genocidal mode of killing. It doesn't matter whether you kill them all. Obviously, they didn't kill all the Jews. They didn't kill all the gypsies. They didn't kill all the Slavs. But each of those killing campaigns undertaken by the Nazis were genocidal. It's to kill in whole or in part. Dissolution is what you want to instigate. Dissolution of the group will ultimately lead to disappearance, not necessarily in a purely physical form. If the group itself goes out of existence, you've got a genocide. So killing is the first of the five criteria, and it is the last of the five criteria that deals with killing. It is the one lethal point. Now, you're going to have lethal dimensions to each of the others, but they've already addressed killing right then and there. Now you've got four more, which is to say that 20% of the legal definition has to do with killing, 80% has to do with other things. Make it a synonym for killing, you've completely lost the meaning of the term. Second is to undertake a policy to visit serious, well, they call it mental harm, by which they meant psychological. Long way from killing when you get to psychological harm being inflicted. Serious mental or physical harm being imposed as a matter of policy upon members of the group by virtue of their group membership. The idea being that they're going to try to disassociate themselves from the group to get out from under the weight of physical and psychological discomfort being imposed upon them. Once they've separated from the group, they'll be free of that. That's called a voluntary dissociation. It's obviously coerced. That's genocidal policy, as defined in international law and as defined by the guy who coined the term. Don't hear much talk about that in this country. In fact, I can't remember anybody talking about it as a genocidal set of circumstances in this country. Maybe I missed something. That happens. But let's just say it's not very prominent in the literature because I've read the literature. Third is to bring about conditions leading to the physical destruction of the group. Now they try to frame that in terms of well, physical destruction, that means killing again. No, they already said killing in the first criteria. They don't need to restate something that was plainly stated in the first criteria by making it more complicated in the third. That has to do with creating the physical circumstances of group dissolution. Forced relocation, for example, is very physical. Nobody's being killed. It's physical circumstance. Destroy the land base upon which a land-linked group, self-identified group, a cultural entity, an indigenous group, for example, destroy the land. That's a physical proposition. They have no place to maintain the constitution of themselves. They've lost their prime simple. They're scattered. They cannot retain group co cohesion, and that's the sort of thing that's at issue. Fourth is to prevent births within a group. Forced sterilization, for example. Compulsory abortion conceivably could be that. Or, and there's lots of examples in this scattered throughout history, in turn a group, segregate them by sex, prevent interaction for procreation or any other purpose, and you're going to accomplish the same thing. Prevention of births in a systematic fashion accomplishes the same thing as killing, but it's an intergenerational sense. If you can hypothetically at least sterilize the totality of the group, people of childbearing age, single generation passes, they will go out of existence biologically just as certainly as if you'd lined them up along an anti-tank ditch and shot them in the head. And the final one, and most germane, they're all germane, but this is most germane to the topic addressed in the book, is the compulsory transfer of children from the targeted group to the targeting group so that they will be raised to understand themselves other, in terms other than those that are necessary to be functioning members of the group from which they're taken. Now, the Germans did that, and that's why Lemkin addressed it. He gave examples in the book in which he coined the term Axis Rule and Occupied Europe of genocidal policy implemented by the Nazis area by area. When you get to Luxembourg, the only policy that he's talking about 
is the compulsory transfer of children. Le legitimate, the legitimation of illegitimate children begat by German soldiers, the occupation troops, for example, and they take the children. They're taking the coming generation of Luxembourg. Luxembourg's a small, fairly contained entity. You take a sufficient number of the children, you bring about dissolution of their sense of identity as a discrete group. They become amalgamated with Germany, and they're gone. That's the nature of the process. Well, I wrote a much longer book on genocide in Native Americans. It's called a Little Matter of Genocide, published by City Lights in 1997. And although I'm quite clear that you do not define genocide in terms of modes of killing, I basically paid short shrift myself some of these other dimensions of the genocidal process. The book was already getting long. The book was already fairly complicated. The book was a handful to digest for most people. It was a difficult read. It's about genocide. Not intended to be pleasant, it's intended to be informative and to reframe things. But as a consequence of those factors, I basically left out the whole dimension of the process that had to do, first and foremost, with the forced transfer of children and what happened to those children once they were transferred. And that's a matter of policy that was implemented by the United States as a sort of cleanup measure. When you have a period that's called the Grant Peace Policy in the 1870s, when they began to look at ways to do several things. One is cut the costs on eradicating the remains of the Indian population. You'd had up till then what I term following the rhetoric of the people who framed the policy area by area in the United States an extermination policy. I've been living in Colorado for the last, coming on 30 years now. Colorado became a state by the promulgation of an outright, and this is the term that was used by Territorial Governor Evans, extermination of the Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians. That gives you Sand Creek, that gives you Summit Springs, that gives you several other lesser known incidents in history. That's how they cleared eastern Colorado of the indigenous population, was exterminating them literally until the survivors fled. And they've never been allowed to come back. I teach at the University of Colorado for a Cheyenne or Arapaho to enroll there, they have to pay out of state tuition, although it's built squarely atop a primary village site. Interesting proposition there. Wouldn't want to take advantage of the Colorado uh, taxpayers by allowing the people whose land the institution is built on to attend it even on standard in-state rates. You have this sort of thing. Well, extermination policy has become cost prohibitive by the 1880s because you've reduced the overall population of native people really down in a number of instances to a kind of hardcore of resistors. And it becomes increasingly expensive to be able to kill them in physical terms. You got the best fighters, the best equipped to evade and engage in guerrilla fashion with the U.S. Army forces. And if you think about the Geronimo campaign, for example, which is in the upper Sonora Desert, during the 1880s, you got less than 50 Chiricahua fighters who've got 5,000 U.S. troops tied up for an indefinite period of time, and they can't catch them. The troops cannot catch the Chiricahuas. This starts to get downright expensive. Now, you've got several other examples these things going on at the same time. And what they're saying is a literal extermination policy ultimately isn't the most cost effective way to finish the job here. And it's beginning increasingly as communications capacity increases in the international scene to generate bad publicity. The United States is garnering a less than lustrous image in the international community. Not that the other particularly European nations aren't doing the same thing in their areas, but I mean their areas are places like, what do they call it, darkest Africa. You don't have a lot of communication coming out of the central region of Africa once they've got the prophylactic drugs to penetrate it, they're able to perpetrate genocide there without notice. But what's happening in the United States, well, it gets kind of highlighted. So if you can change policy and accomplish the job through some less messy means, particularly if you can cast it in humanitarian garb, you will garner certain advantages in terms of international reputation, image, and so forth. 
There's several other factors, but we can leave those as well. So what you have is a transition from extermination policy to what they call, and this is the term they used, assimilation. Now they call it mainstreaming. Okay, I don't want you to think it went away. They just changed the term and went right ahead with business as usual. Assimilation really means digestion. And what they're saying is you've reduced the native population to such a thin residue, there's so few people left that the overburden of settlers, primarily white settlers, not exclusively so, but this predominating mass, 40 million heading for 60 million, and by the turn of the century it's going to be 80 million as compared to fewer than a quarter million surviving Indians. That overburden of settler population can absorb in genetic terms, and certainly in cultural terms, the residue of native population. They're going to be gone, but we don't have to go through the image smearing, suffer the loss of esteem in the international community, or engage in the kind of expenditures for military purposes that we've been engaged in increasingly in the latter part of the, of the 19th century. So assimilation policy follows two primary axes. One has to do with the direct intervention in the residue of land the residue of population retains, which mid-1880s is about 150 million acres. Now the intervention is to take a collective landholding society. That's the custom. They organize socially on the basis of a collectivity of utilization of the real property that they retain. That's the traditional way. And that's considered to be evidence of savagery. In fact, it's a barrier preventing their assimilation into proper society. So you have this direct intervention through the General Allotment Act to impose individuated land title, break up the collectivity of holdings, consequently the social and political organization. And a nice little caveat there, okay, each Indian is going to be allotted a fixed parcel of land upon which they're supposed to be able to figure out how to support themselves in the manner of proper anglophones, 150 million acres, fewer than a quarter million Indians, average of 160 acres on partial, orphans will get 80, and so on, so on. Well, there's fewer Indians, depending on how you identify who an Indian is and consequently who is eligible to receive an allotment, than there are multiple 160-acre parcels within the reservation land base. So there's this caveat attached to the General Allotment Act that says each, once each Indian who has been deemed eligible to receive an allotment receives his or her allotment, the balance of the reserved territory will be declared surplus and opened up to white homesteading, corporate utilization, conversion into military reservation, whatever, non-Indian usage. So of that 150 million acres, aggregate asset that the Indians retain, 1885, the act is passed in 1887, by 1934, 100 million acres of it's gone. Now these are round numbers, these are not precise, but two-thirds of the remaining property at the end of the 19th century passes to non-Indian control through this civilizing measure, this assimilating measure. There's a lot more that can be said about that, but that's the one poll that's not addressed in the book. The second poll is the understanding that Indians who are adults and functioning are pretty well set in terms of who they are, even though that's adverse to some perception of interest. They see themselves as Indians in the world. They understand the world as Indians. They're not particularly malleable. They've been through a hard time and quite resistant. You're not going to break them down, usually unless you're willing to engage in things that are cost intensive enough to make the military options seem palatable again. So you're breaking them up with this intervention in land tenure where you're going to really put your horsepower in terms of the assimilation of Indi individual Indians, however, is take children, raise them to see being Indian, which is to say ultimately to see themselves through the eyes with the values the perceptions of a culture who so despises Indians that its official policy is to eliminate or eradicate them. You can see where the problem is beginning to emerge right here. 
upshot of that is what's talked about, kill the Indian, save the man. And that's that, although there are antecedents that run clear back into colonial times, you really pick this up about 1880, and you got things that run beyond it. Phoenix Indian School, for example, the actual Bureau of Indian Affairs administered institution in Phoenix, doesn't close its doors until 1990. But basically, between 1880 and 1980, during that 100-year period of time, you have a comprehensive system of residential educational facilities, is what they call it. Usually down here, they're called boarding schools. That's a bit of a misnomer. In Canada, it's just referred to as residential schools. They're all residential facilities, and some of them are defined as being boarding schools. Their object is to educate. They don't actually mean educate. They mean to indoctrinate, as I'll explain in a moment. But you've got the boarding schools, and then you've got, and this is actually the prototype, which referred to as the Indian industrial schools. Now, Indian industrial schools also include agricultural schools. But the object here, as articulated, is to take every American Indian child between 5 and 15 years of age, remove them geographically, physically, from their family, from their community, from their society, from their culture, at as early an age as possible when you pick up. Now, the youngest child actually met the woman. The youngest child taken to one of these institutions was two. I've got pictures in the book of kids who are three and four years old. Now, they've been taken, usually coercively, not always. If they can convince the parents to give up their children for educational purposes and to be removed halfway across the country for their own good, fine. That's it. But if the parents are not quite willing to do that, then you've got this sort of ratchet series of measures that will apply to coerce compliance. First, they will cut off commodities, say. Now, you've got Indians who utilize a fairly broad sprawl of territory to be self-sufficient, to attain subsistence and so forth, compress them onto a reservation, deprive them of their weapons and livestock. They're utterly dependent on the government for rations in order to eat personally, feed their children, and so forth. Those are called commodities. That's what's issued for subsistence. You don't deliver your children, your commodities are cut off. You're not going to eat until you do. What's more, those kids aren't going to eat until you do. Let me know when you're ready to deliver your child. And you got people find ways around that. They've been divested of weaponry by and large, but weapons can be had. So you got people who resist that kind of coercion, forage, hunt, barter, whatever, feed their family anyway. Well, next level is we'll send BIA police. We'll send Indian police. That's usually Indians who have been recruited by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to be the enforcement of the administrative apparatus. They will come. Now, you had people that were able to resist that as well, often people ran out into wilderness areas and had to be tracked down. But they would aggregate in groups to where they could defend themselves from the Indian police. Then you get non-Indian police in the mix and ultimately you get troops utilized. And you've got army expeditions that are sent out to impound children. They're out tracking down children and taking them from their parents by force. It's a pretty traumatic thing for a child. Four or five year old trial, gonna watch mama screaming well, dad is beaten into the ground, and you've got cases, Alcatraz Island out here had a whole group of Hopis whose only reason for being there was they refused to give up their kids in the 1890s. And they did, some of them did 12 years on the rock as a result of that. It was exemplary punishment to get the message across. We are going to take your kids one way or another. Well, there is one curb on that. And I didn't know George... W. Bush was in office that long ago, but the reason they didn't take all the kids is it just cost too much. I mean, they couldn't divert the funds into profit for Halliburton or whatever the correspondent was in that day. So you end up with, although the stated policy objective is to take all the kids, they take about half. Okay, generation by generation, 
really for five consecutive generations. Now, that's not that every kid that's in that half spends that entire period from five to 15 in a residential facility, but they spent some part of their supposed educational experience in one of these facilities and often were taken this way. Well, there's implications to that. You got a child who's just witnessed physical force used against his parents or her parents as the case may be in order to take them they don't particularly want to be taken but they are and chained to a buggy or whatever the vehicle is that is being utilized for transport and you get it full of kids and then you'll take it to train depot where they are placed under guard and put in a contraption they've never seen before you got all these aliens who are herding them through the process. There'll be a slight break. I've been told I have a big mouth, but it's probably not big enough to compete with the fire engines here in San Francisco. Okay. Once on the train, they are then taken, usually as far geographically as is possible within the boundaries of the United States to transport them. Kids from Pima, Salt River, Apache Reservations in Arizona, Mescalero in New Mexico and so forth being taken to Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. Kids from Washington State, that is, being taken into Oklahoma. Oklahoma kids are often being taken up in the South Dakota. Move them places that are remote from where they come from. Now it's going to be an alien environment and that's to the advantage of people who are going to break down their sense of self and identity. But it has a couple of immediate beneficiary effects beyond that. I think that's something that is conceived of as being an advantage a little after the fact. In the first instance what they're looking at is if you take the kids and put them in a geographic location remote from where they're being taken from, it's going to absolutely retard the ability of the family to visit. There's not going to be interaction with family, community members, the elders, spiritual leaders, and so on. But it's also going to be a barrier retarding the ability of the kids to escape the institution and get back home. Now, you've got kids who are five, six, seven, eight, nine, even into early adolescence. What exactly are they going to do when they escape from Carlisle and their home is 1,500 miles away? Well, I'll tell you what they're going to do is they're going to try to get home. And you got any number of kids. There's no accurate count on this, either in the United States or Canada, which runs a parallel system through this entire period. There's any number of kids, no accurate count, who run and are never seen again. Now, you got a bunch that are found, too. So you've got a steady attrition. More mortal attrition, lethal attrition of kids who run, no possibility of getting where they're going. And you got kids who are running with a windbreaker in a Manitoba winter up in Canada. That's what finally breaks the back of the system up there is the Charlie Winjack case. You got a 14 year old kid that tried to get home 700 miles in, I think it was December of 1965, wearing sneakers and a windbreaker and froze to death trying to follow a railroad track. And you got them drowning in lakes and rivers that they're trying to cross and so on. And this is just steady throughout this whole period. You've got that kind of situation. But the overall situation, we've got military people in here. Some of this may be recognizable to you, and I'm going to explain why in a moment. First thing they do is kind of a shock and awe campaign when the kids arrive in an already traumatized condition at the institution, they're met by people much larger than themselves, looking quite alien, who are speaking in very loud voices in a not particularly friendly manner and are laying down the law to them. And the law is, you give us everything you have, material possession, right now. We're taking your clothes. We're taking any sacred objects you have. We're taking anything you, we, you have that is a memento of your family. We're taking anything you have of any consequence in terms of assigning meaning, identity to you at your early age. We're going to replace that with a military uniform. Boys, over here. You're going to be shorn of your hair. You're going to get a close crop military haircut. That's for hygienic reasons, they'll tell you. 
Hygiene's an interesting thing. Apparently women don't have those problems. Girls don't have those problems because they didn't cut the girl's hair. One would assume if it's for hygiene, if it's about lice, if it's about these sorts of things, as they've claimed with regard to the shearing of the boy's hair, it would have been equally applicable to the females, but females with long hair are acceptable in a dominant society. Boys are not. Their shearing identity is what they're doing. Hair has a particular significance in most indigenous cultures, and they're taking that away. They're dirty Indians, as is explained to them often in their own language, and so consequently they're subjected to disinfection. They're bathed, usually in rather hot water, usually with stiff bristle brushes and the, using various astringents, including considerable amounts of lye soap, kerosene, and other things of that sort. It's interesting, dirty Indians have now been disinfected. Okay, the hygienic conditions within these schools is absolutely abysmal from there on, but they have to be cleaned up in order to be placed in a squad bay, living barrack style with 50 other boys, okay, and without sanitary facilities of any particular consequence and so on. So again, the stated objective, while it might seem superficially plausible, makes no sense in the overall context of the practice. This is to break them down. And this is the beginning of a sense of absolute degradation of Indians in the eyes of these Indian children. That's going to be reinforced with the kind of instruction that they're going to receive throughout the course of their educational career. The law is going to be formalized on the basis of punishment. And after they're cleaned, and after they're clad, and after they look like a little group of West Point cadets or a little bit of maids in training, it's going to be explained. You've got a certain period of time, those of you who do not already speak English, which is the majority in the 1880s and probably right on into the 1920s, if you're found speaking in your language, after a certain point, you will be punished. If you're caught singing your songs, you will be punished. If you're caught praying in a traditional way, you will be punished. If you're caught communicating with people in where you came from without direct permission, of the people in charge of you, you will be punished. If you steal food, you will be punished. If you do this, you will be punished. If you do that, you will be punished. Now, when we're talking punishment, we're talking corporal punishment. And we're not talking corporal punishment like getting taken down the hall to the principal's office and getting three swats with a paddle. Carlisle, which is the archetypal school, is a military barracks. It's Carlisle Barracks. It's converted to an Indian school. It has a guardhouse. It's the template for the others. You go to Haskell, there's a guardhouse. You go down here to Sherman, there's a guardhouse. Those guardhouses are there for a reason. It's a military regime of punishment. You got kids in solitary confinement, you got kids with ball and chain, you got kids with shackles, you got kids tied to posts for periods extending from a few days to 60 days is the longest duration that I've come across in the US schools. They may have been longer in some cases in Canada. You got kids in these conditions, in these guardhouses on bread and water rations, which actually might even be improvement over the regular diet in some instances. That's the first round or level of punishment. You got kids standing in attention in a hot sun. You got kids who wet the bed because they're traumatized, forced to wear the sheet over their head and stand at attention while they're being ridiculed by their classmates. And you've got kids who were flogged. And I don't mean by flogging the swats with a paddle. You got kids who are subjected to the cat of nine tails. For those of you who don't know, that's a nine lash whip. And you got kids who were whipped with cat of nine tails, modified with metal studs and knots and yeah. And you're talking children. You're talking children. And this is the, the cultural breakdown in a behavioral sense. Meanwhile, now you're going to do the education piece of this, and the education piece of this, well, I don't know what some of the older people in the room were taught about Indians. When you came through the public school system, I know what I was taught, and that's not 100 years ago. They're being subjected to learning about Native people through people who write triumphalist history that begins in 1620 or 1607 or 1776, certainly not before Columbus, 
that history worth knowing as history begins when Europeans come and you've got these sort of like barbaric hordes that are blocking the progress of enlightenment in the continent, degraded, Satan spawn, all of that. None of their own history, the triumphalist history of the Western conquest of their people, rationalized through a degradation and demeaning of the nature of their people. Now, that's an intellectual proposition until you get up in the morning and look in the mirror and see staring back at you what it is you're being taught to revile. Heavy doses of patriotism, that's a big deal too. You're supposed to celebrate the conqueror. So they, in military formations, are celebrating the 4th of July and all of the rest of that, the iconographic history of the United States, celebrating Andrew Jackson, for example, Andrew Jackson who cut the noses off of the red sticks at Horseshoe Bend in order to get an accurate count of the dead. Yeah, you can sort of see that there's a little bit of deformity of self-concept and consequently because you're still going to have that mirror to look in the morning self-esteem as well. And that has a recursive effect on trauma as well. Remember I said, however, that these are industrial schools. This education that I'm talking about, this indoctrination in a triumphalist history of the United States, the impartation of rudimentary schools, reading, writing, arithmetic at certain levels that will be useful in the labor market when these kids are converted into the manual laborers that the dominant society sees them being, is accompanied by a little Christian instruction. About half the morning is academic learning, half the morning is Christian indoctrination. Now they divide the schools up between religious denominations, so the Baptists get some, the Catholics get some, the Mormons get some, the Episcopalians get some. You got a lot of clergy and you got a lot of lay clergy that are involved under government authority in running these. Now, the particular version of Christianity you're going to be indoctrinated with in a given school depends on the denomination that school's been assigned to or parceled out to in order to proselytize the kids into being lifetime members of the church. That's their payback. But the common denominator in all that is they're teaching them a couple things. One is sexual repression. You really get punished if a boy is found with a girl and vice versa and so forth. It's going to take on a particular connotation in a little bit. And I want to look at my watch now because, as I say, this can run about an hour and a half, usually. And how far in am I here? Running close to an hour now? 40 minutes? We're going to run a little over the 45, I promised, okay? And that's just the way it's going to work, I guess, because I can't really compress it to 45 and lay it out. I'm going to go for it. Sexual repression being one piece, and as I say, that will take on a particular connotation in a moment. But the other thing has to do with the benefit of work. You need to work. You cannot be a lazy savage. Okay, work is what makes you human. Work is what makes you useful. Work is what lends you value. Work is what takes you out of your tradition. All right? You've got this indoctrination in the morning. You're going to go to lunch, and then you're going to go to work. Okay? That'll help with the sexual repression part, because if we can exhaust you, you're not going to act like kids tend to act with the testosterone rush and such during adolescence. Okay, but the other piece is we're going to, like, hammer home these things. In the name of a sort of a low-tech idea, we're going to teach you a trade. And that trade's going to allow you to enter civilized society in the aftermath of your school experience. Okay? So you've got the morning hours and this education indoctrination process partly academic, partly Christian indoctrination, the second half of the day, about four hours, sometimes running up to six. And this is when the schools are functioning as designed, is going to be invested in labor. The industrial schools mean just that. They have metal working plants, they have leather manufacturing plants, they have woodworking plants, they're producing product. And that product is being sold in the sale of the products that are being made by the kids impressed into labor to be taught a trade in the afternoon goes to subsidizing the school and that keeps the tax burden down, see. All right, same thing in agricultural schools. You're going out and you're doing field labor. Again, I come from Colorado. The sugar beet industry in eastern Colorado developed during the 1920s as a result of kids being sent over in the summer to be work crews from the Haskell Indian School to work essentially for nothing. Oh, they were being paid at a 
steep discount rate, but the money was going to the school, their labor was subsidizing the school. So they're, they're doing stoop labor in the fields all summer long during the high school years to pay for their own incarceration. May sound a little familiar, those of you who uh, paid attention to Arnold Schwarzenegger and some predecessors who said that people who are increasingly prosecuted and sent to prison and proliferating system of penal system of California ought to be obliged to pay for their own upkeep. And so you got corporations coming in and benefiting from that discount labor and the wages paid to the prisoners, a portion goes to subsidizing the incarceration. They didn't ask to be there. Arguably, the people in the prison system did something to get there. That's often not true, but at least arguably that would be the case. But these people are in there as kids simply by virtue of being born who they were. Two pieces of this get really interesting. Shilako Indian School in Oklahoma would be an example of how this works. Okay? In the early 1930s, you got a report coming from the superintendent of Shilako, which they tell you means prairie light. Sounds kind of like a nice place. The Shilako students produced enough agricultural product in the early 1930s to make contributions to retire the deficit of the state budget every year. Okay? Flandreau Indian School up in South Dakota is an even better example. It was completely subsidized on the basis of the agricultural products produced by children, including a dairy operation. Now, every morning, those kids would be gotten up with the sun to get on a wagon and haul cream and butter and milk and eggs into Flandreau, South Dakota. The non-Indian population would buy it all at a handy profit to the school. The kids would then return to the school to have breakfast, which consisted of coffee, toast, and lard. No dairy. All the dairy that they were producing through their labor was being sold in the non-Indian economy to subsidize the school. Conditions in the South Dakota reservations were those of destitution then and now. The average male student, early adolescence, attending Flandreau Indian School will be taken from Pine Ridge Rosebud, which are the destitute reservations. And during the course of the average academic year, they would lose nine pounds. That's how that ran. Now, partly, the labor is necessary because of the nature of the process. Partly, the labor is necessary because of the nature of the subsidy that's provided to the school. I told you they were underfunded to the point where they could only get one and two when they had an object of taking them all. But the one and two could be taken only on the basis of completely underfunding the upkeep of each individual child. 1938 in Canada, the average expenditure in Canadian dollars per Indian student in a residential institution, compulsory confinement was 180 bucks. Now, Indian residential facilities are not the only residential youth facilities in Canada. Orphanage in Winnipeg was expending $292 per year. That's the cheapest non-Indian expenditure I could find. School for the Deaf in Manitoba was $648 per year per student. 300 percent. The United States is about the same and actually in some cases would actually go higher so that you got four and five hundred percent of what is spent on an Indian student in one of the residential facilities being spent on a white student and that accounts for starvation. Basically what you got is chronic malnutrition among the children in the schools as a cost-cutting measure. And that's coupled to the fact that adequate medical attention was not provided because that would be too expensive as well. Now you got kids who are malnourished and subjected to a routine of heavy labor. You understand that with agricultural labor. Anybody that's done it knows it's debilitating. It's very demanding. Malnutrition and field labor add up to some very significant consequences overall, but the one that we need to pay attention to here is debilitation, reduced resistance to disease, because you've also got these kids cooped up 
and minimal cost upkeep facilities like barracks bays where if one kid gets whooping cough, they're all going to have it by morning. If one kid gets measles, and so you have epidemic diseases breaking out as well. Result of that in Canada is that Duncan Campbell Scott, who's in charge of the Indian educational system, acknowledges in the mid-1920s that one in two children entering the residential system are not coming out alive. 50% mortality rate. Now you've got epidemic tuberculosis that's flourishing under reservations and in the schools in the United States where the, doc the records are not nearly as well kept or at least have not been brought out, but you've got mortality rates that are entirely comparable down here. They knew it. In Canada, the response was as the children died, they packed even more children into the school. And I don't mean they're simply replacing the one and two that's dying. They're increasing the aggregate number. The overall number continues to go up. And Campbell cuts medical service even further. Interesting. Interesting. Interesting when you find a correspondence to that in the Merriam Report to the United States. This is known. Tuberculosis is the major killer both north and south of the border in the residential schools. This is known. That's a part of the literature. It's also part of the literature about tuberculosis both north and south of the border in North America that when you got people who are contracting tuberculosis, what they require is rest, fresh air, food, ventilated environment. They're being crammed into these quarters. They're being malnourished and they're being worked and they're being denied anything resembling adequate medical attention. That's both north and south during that period. 50% mortality rate adds up to, if you want to think about it, a quarter of the population. 25 percentile attrition of the native population, five generations back to back with the coming generation being the segment of the population that bears the brunt. Now, statistical comparison, I think, is a little deceptive, but it can also be instructive in terms of framing the implications of something. So let me frame a little comparison here. You got 50% mortality rate in the schools under the conditions that I've described as a process of breaking down native culture to turn it into something else, okay? You've heard of Dachau? Dachau had a 19% mortality rate. That's the most notorious of the Nazi concentration camps. That should not be confused with an extermination camp. Concentration camps and extermination centers are completely different systems. There's a conflation of that term, and you use the term concentration camp, and they say, oh, you're shrill and you're exaggerating and you're playing to effect because obviously this wasn't Auschwitz. No, and I'm not saying that it was. I'm saying it was comparable in its effects to a concentration camp, which is something else again. Labor camps as well. Dachau was 19%. Buchenwald was in the, no, excuse me, Buchenwald was 19%. Dachau was in the mid 30th percentile. The worst of the Nazi concentration camps had a mortality rate of about 60%, just a little over. That's my thousand. 50% versus 60% is not a particularly great margin. These schools were claiming their occupants at the same rate as the Nazi camps. And we know what we think of the Nazi camps. And the Nazi camps were doing this to functioning adults. These schools were having an effect on children. And we can go off into other things as well. When you've got corporal punishment in isolated incidents where the population is considered to be so expendable that these conditions that I'm talking about would be imposed and maintained for a hundred years. Well, they're not places that people who can get jobs working the City Lights bookstore probably want to go apply. Not going to be holding jobs there. None of you are going to be applying there either. You don't want to volunteer to go live on the North Dakota Prairie with a bunch of Indian kids under really harsh conditions. And you're not going to be living all that much better than they are. And you're not going to have a social existence. You're not going to see people of your own kind and have conversations and much of life and not a particularly great rate of compensation. Who you figure is going to go there? 
Well, they're going to be people who can't quite get jobs in places like San Francisco and in bookstores and universities and mix too much with normal society. And now you've got these people in charge of those kids with a license to engage in corporal punishment, and you've got kids who are going to try to resist. Now, I've already talked about cat and nine tails with metal studs and cat and nine tails with knots, so it would inflict more damage, and you're going to get sadism that runs much higher than that. You're going to get kids who are burned and scalded and forced to eat their own vomit and have needles run through their tongues because they speak their own language, and all these are a matter of record. And in the midst of all that sexual repression, you're going to end up licensing sexual predators in these institutions. You got schools in Canada where it's record now. 100% of the students recently, we're talking in the last couple generations of the residential schools, 100% of the students haven't been sexually molested by people on staff, occasionally clergy. Should be no great surprise that what happened in the Boston Archdiocese wasn't restricted to there. It didn't only happen to nice little white altar boys. It happened to these captive children too. Now, being subjected to sadism and torture and even being subjected to sexual predation didn't happen to every child in the school. That's true. No one reasonably could argue that it did. But where it was happening, which is in virtually every school, virtually every student knew it was happening and that has a traumatic effect too. What you got is a protracted trauma. Deep trauma. Trauma is usually considered to be an event. Rape is a trauma. Rape is also an event. It has a constrained interval. It happens. Then you got the after effects to deal with. A natural catastrophe. The Johnstown flood. An earthquake. A volcanic eruption. It happens. It's an event. You got trauma as a result of that event. You got aftershocks to be dealt with becomes much more complicated when it's not an event, but it's a series of events recursive over a period of time. That was a big problem with Vietnam vets. It wasn't usually an event that happened. It was a, the event was happening over and over and over again, day in, day out. Much more intractable, much more difficult to deal with. What happens when that event occurs not just over a 365-day tour of combat duty, but lasts six, seven, eight, nine years. What happens when it's happening that way and you're not 19, 20, 21 years old, but you're six, seven, and eight years old? The earlier it happens, the more severe the trauma. The longer, more repetitively it happens, the more intractable. Well, the schools were meeting their objectives. The schools were designed to take people who are American Indians and render them dysfunctional as Indians. The guy who set it up in the United States, Richard Henry Pratt, defined the mission of the schools as to kill the Indian, save the man, which is the title of the book, and every single pupil. Note the juxtaposition. By man, he meant human. The old sexist vernacular. To be Indian, you would not be human. To be human, you could not be Indian. Well, the Indian was destroyed. But what replaces the Indian in these people? They're phenotypical Indians, usually. You eyeball them, they're Indians. If you despise Indians enough to do this to them, what are you going to do with this Indian that comes out the side of the school, the other side of the school? Just because they've been destroyed psychologically and intellectually as an Indian, you're going to treat them as white? Of course you're not. No racist responding to phenotypes is going to do that. They can't even do it with themselves because they're still on the other side of the school afflicted with the mirror. And they're going to be dealing with 2,000 John Ford movies and 10,000 television segments and the Florida State Seminoles and the Washington Redskins and the Kansas City Chiefs and the Cleveland Indians and the Tumbleweeds cartoons and and what? 
Atlanta Braves, okay, we won't leave them out. The TP Motel and the Big Chief Writing Tablet and the Hiawatha Pencil and the Chief Jeep Cherokee, and you want me to go on. It's a continuous tone. All the demeaning and degrading and commodifying and dehumanizing stereotypes that were imposed upon them are a continuous tone once they're on out. Where do you turn? Your trauma is replicated continuously. What it is that's been done to you is continuously reinforced. What do you do about post-traumatic stress when you can't get to the post because the trauma is continuously reimposed? We don't have a therapeutic paradigm for that. But I'll tell you what the upshot is. The upshot is a suicide rate among American Indian men today is 500 percent the national average. A suicide rate among American Indian adolescents, I mean, they got suicide clubs. Wind River Reservation, it was 1,400 percent the national average about 10 years ago. You got entire locales up in northern Manitoba, seven in every 10 children actively inhaling gasoline to try to obviate, obliter obliterate their consciousness, the consciousness of the reality they inhabit. The traumatized parents and dysfunctional community that results from the imposition of this for your own good kind of civilizing measure. Labrador at 100% and the people asking the government to come in and take their children, although they know that being taken as children is what put them in a position that causes this problem with their children. And here's the nature of the thing. Trauma is transmissible. You come out of the residential school and you are not employable. You are not able to fit back into your culture. You cannot be fitted into the dominant culture that did this to you. You have no place to be. You're absolutely desperate for the first time in your life to achieve something normal. What do you do? What's normal? Do you even know what that is at that point? Well, normal seems to be getting married and have kids, have a family, try to establish some sort of stable home life. But traumatized, can you do that? No, but you get married, you have the kids, you usually marry another residential school survivor. But you can't provide for them. You're emotionally numbed, you're empathy impaired, you suffer somatic disorders so that you can't sleep at night, you hear voices. You react to stimuli that doesn't bother other people in ways that are completely contrary to socially acceptable norms. And you're going to feel guilt for that. You don't even know how to raise a family because you were never raised in one. What are you role modeling on when you're taken at six years old and subjected to this? Your only parental figures are going to be the people who did it to you. And guess what you're going to do to your kids? You're going to have that demon tension swirling around in your life, and you're going to begin one of two processes. You're going to eat a gun, or you're going to do it in slow motion with a bottle. One in two American Indian adults in the 20th century was assessed as being a severe and chronic alcoholic. Now, you've got whole intellectual cottage industries over here, Berkeley and University of Colorado, where I work, and throughout the country trying to figure out whether there's some peculiar trait in the Indian DNA which predisposes to alcoholism or the anthropology department whether there's little quirkiness in Indian cultures traditionally that predisposes us to alcoholism. Hey, let me give any of you who want to take a PhD your dissertation topic. You take that one in two correlation of people that were run through the schools or who are children of people who were run through the schools. And you match it up as nearly as possible to lists of people who received treatment for severe alcoholism through government programs over a period of time and see if you don't get a match on the names. See that genetic business and that cultural analysis business and all those are ways of displacing the responsibility for victimization to the victims and letting the dominant society that did it as a matter of policy for its own perception of interest under the rubric of doing it for the own goods of the people it was systematically victimizing and it would have taken an absolute moron not to see that that was true or an absolutely arrogant clan style racist not to see that it was true letting yourself off the hook and putting the victims on, which compounds the problem that results in a truncation of lifespan when you add up the suicides, you add up the death by alcoholism, and you add up the other 
kinds of violence that attend this sort of circumstances that is imposed circumstance ends up with a lifespan that is truncated for males, American Indian males in a society now by one third and females by even worse. Men, American Indian men now, 2005, tend to live about 50 years. In some reservation areas like South Dakota, it's a little less than that on average. Women tend to live on average about three years longer. G-pop men in this society live about 75 years. That's one third truncation of lifespan. For the men, women seem to be doing a little better until you look at the fact that G-pop women tend to live about eight years longer than G-pop men. So proportionally speaking, American Indian women are living even less long than men. 35% roughly attrition, truncation of lifespan, it can be construed as attrition. That's a third of the population being consumed by that process and its after effects every generation for the 20th century. 35th percentile is genocidal in any way you want to cut it, by any definition you want to use. That's the part that was left out of a little matter of genocide. That's the completion. Even at this length, which goes longer than I meant to go in the first place before letting you get out questions and comments that you wanted to get into, I've just brushed the highlights. I've left out quite a bit that should have been talked about but I think you get the general drift. This is not necessarily precise in the sense that every aspect of it is directly accurate and substantial in government documents that are withheld or they purport to be lost or any of the rest of it. But the general thrust of it is absolutely well established and the effects are even clearer. You can go to an Indian bar in San Francisco and see the carnage that results tonight. Victim blaming is not something that's going to carry us into a position of doing and acting differently in the future. I don't think probably anybody in the room here tonight or anybody that's going to see this on book TV or too many people outside the Ku Klux Klan itself or corollary organizations are going to say they take as an object the imposition of this kind of pain and suffering on others. The question then becomes how to avoid it. And the how to avoid it begins with calling things by their right names and not talking about this as well-intentioned, a tragedy, something that was inadvertent. These are obfuscations and modes of denial. This was genocide undertaking as such that met the legal definition in its very formulation and in its being carried out, the implementation of the policy, it had the intended effect. That reverberates. But that cognition, facing up to what the reality is, is the only way to begin the process of averting the repetition of that and ultimately of ending the chain reaction kind of carnage that ensues in Native America that's already been unleashed. Neither of those objectives can be achieved without facing up to the reality of this and call the process by its right name. The G word is genocide. It fits this aspect of American history, this aspect of the relationship between the indigenous people and the settler population, just as the other aspects that are talked about in a larger book do as well. Thank you very much for listening. So as I mentioned, some of you might not have heard when you came in, um, in order to facilitate the, the taping of, of this event for TV, we're going to ask you to write down your questions and pass them up this way and then we'll read them aloud and have Ward answer. So I'm, uh, there's little pieces of paper around if anybody has extra ones, maybe you could pass some back. I also want to just take a moment while we're doing this to thank someone here, Shante Mouton, who is our Associate Director of Marketing and Publicity, has worked really hard to put this event together and also to make sure that Ward's book gets out and uh, she's responsible for Ward being here tonight. So thank you, Shante. Okay, so first question. To what extent do you believe that religion is a driver for genocide? 
The question was, to what extent do I believe that religion is a driver for genocide? And I don't know how to quantify that. I mean, extent indicates some means. 38 percent? 75? I think it's variable by circumstance and by context to a certain extent. But any, whether it's theology or ideology, that allows a given group to appoint itself as chosen, as superior to another, and therefore entitled to that which the other possesses. And in a process of rationalizing that dispossession of the other and absorption of that which is theirs, to rework the other in its own image. Any ideology or theology that goes in that direction is genocidal. It's a genocidal mentality, as it was framed by Lifton and Marcuson and, and other students of the psychology of genocide. And it, it's not especially unique. My last a point in addressing that is Her Hannah Arendt's point that the malevolence that could be considered a genocidal mentality. You see, the problem is it's not monstrous. It's so common as to be banal. You want to find the genocidal mentality? Probably. I'm not going to point to who it is, but there's several people sitting in the room can go home and look at the mirror. Truly. You're not perceiving as such because it's common. You've been indoctrinated too. If you see yourself as being superior to the guy who's laying out in the gutter on your way home tonight, and he asks you for spare change and you treat him like he's a bum, you're there. Uh, okay. There's a question here. Do you know much about the experiences of boys versus girls in those schools? To begin, did equal number of boys and girls end up there, and what happened to them? Okay. Question. I'll repeat the question again. Do I know about the relative experiences of boys and girls in the schools were roughly even numbers of them taken? And there was another part to it? Well, I guess and also their experience once they Once the experience once, once they were out. Yeah. I do know. Beginning with it's roughly equal numbers. Now, given place, given time. There may be some disequilibrium, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. It's, it's about 50-50, boys and girls, okay? And I've already indicated one of the, the differences. Boys are going to be shorn of their hair, subjected to that particular humiliation. Girls are not. Girls, on the other hand, going to have their own particular lexicon. This is very much divided by sex on the basis of labor, first and foremost. Okay, boys are going to be taught to do men's work. That's in the shops, that's in the fields, that's doing the stoop labor for the sugar beet harvest, that's going to be baling hay, that's going to be working a forge. Men's work, you know what I mean. We're a little removed from it now, we think. I kind of smirk at that, but we got the tradition down, and even people who are too young to have been brought up under it without opposition to it recognize it when they hear it. That's boys' work. Now, girls' work, washing, ironing, baking, cooking, being farmed out. You ever wonder where that term came from, farmed out? That's the kids that were sent from Haskell to the sugar beet field. They weren't sent home in the summer. They were farmed out to work on farms. That comes from the Indian schools. Girls were farmed out not to do farm labor. They were farmed out to do domestic labor. Now, as I said, this is all indicate, was all indicated by way of teaching trades. Okay? Now, I suppose being a seamstress can be a trade. There's nothing dishonorable in that trade. And... I would suppose to be proficient in that trade, say you're going to be specializing in shirtwaists, 
Someone needs to teach you how to make shirt waist. Take them a few days to do that, all probability. And then you're going to, in order to perfect your facility at that, going to need to go through several repetitions. You're going to have to make a few shirt waists before you can be considered competent for employment purposes at making shirt waists or skirts or shirts or jacket, whatever you're making. Figure it's going to take you five, six, seven years of repetitions before you know. How about working in a laundry? How many loads of wash do you need to wash before you know how to do a load of wash? Okay, iron in bed sheets. I never understood why anybody needed a bed sheet iron myself, but I'm kind of one of those primitive types, I guess. Not really genteel enough to appreciate it. So somebody's going to pay you to iron sheets. How many bed sheets do you know how do you need to iron before you know how to iron a bed sheet? And see, this is what's happening with both boys and girls. This idea of a Votech experience so that you're being taught a trade passes pretty quick. These are not high skill occupations you're being trained for, it's manual labor. After, oh, let's be really charitable. After the first six months, you know everything you possibly could learn out of the experience to be employable in a laundry or a seamstress shop or a harness maker shop by and large. After that, it's forced labor, and that's all there is to it. It's not compensated labor, it's essentially penal labor. Now, I need to say something about Captain Pratt that snaps this in focus, perhaps. And that is his qualification to found the Carlisle Indian School and ultimately to found the entire system of industrial schools was that he was the warden of the Fort Marion military prison in Florida. Okay? Pretty interesting qualification for a school superintendent to be a prison warden. But a whole lot of what I've been talking about tonight starts to snap into focus. Now, doesn't it? Fort Marion wasn't your average prison. It wasn't military people who were sent to it, although it was a military prison. Who was sent there? Those who were called the recalcitrants of the Cheyenne. This would be the hardcore resistors of the dog soldiers the really hardline Comanche and Kiowa resistors, the Chiricahua Apaches of Geronimo. And his specialization was developing techniques to break down this hardest core of adult resistance and render them subservient. Now, these are techniques that are very much alive in U.S. penal doctrine today. Isolation and development of techniques to break down and compel ideological conver uh, conversion, as they call it, among political prisoners, for example. All right? The stated objective of that is to render them so helpless and so desperate that they'll do anything, agree to anything, to make it stop. And this usually works off of isolation and sensory deprivation. And he had tried those, pioneered those as well. But in the event that the ideological determination is so strong that you cannot compel conversion, you force desperation in a direction that will cause them to self-nullify, that is to say, suicide. Oh yeah, that's what your tax dollars are going to pay for up at Pelican Bay. That's what your tax dollars are going to pay for at the new Level 7 prison. Unheard of. Level 6 is top max. They got a Level 7 federal prison in Colorado, where the people inside are in a box, they never see another human being. They don't get fed by human beings, they get fed by conveyor belt. They have white light. They have white walls. They have non-movable bunks. They have no stimulation. Okay, often they know why they got in, but what they don't know is what's required of them in order to get out. And there's no fixed, yeah. These are techniques that arise as a result, I mean, you can trace them right back to Pratt. This is the guy they put in charge of the children to break them down and convert. Yeah, and he's a military man, so all that military stuff I was talking about fits right in. That's what he's trained to do. That's what he's trained to be. He does it quite proficiently. And the kids 
who would not convert end up dead. It doesn't matter whether you're a boy or girl at that point. Flandron Indian School is still in existence and sends pretty address labels with Indian motifs begging for donations. What kind of people run it now? Are there any changes? They don't do a lot of this. Oh, let me repeat the question. Flandro Indian School still exists. Sends out pretty little things soliciting money. Charitable donation to run itself. What kind of people run it? I guess the implication of that is, does it still have the same effect? No, it's not necessary to have that effect. Okay, the job's already been accomplished. Indian kids are taking the same educational dosage every day as non-Indian kids. Day schools are more cost effective, so really in the 1930s you begin to see a transition away from the residential school structure. It remains in effect. Lots and lots of kids going through it right up into the 1980s and ultimately, as I said, Phoenix doesn't close until 1990. Now, some of those facilities have been taken over by Indian groups. The Institute for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico is a residential school and it ran in conjunction with the Santa Fe Indian School. But this residential school is run by Indians to accommodate Indian kids and the conditions there are quite a bit different. And the kids are not being taken by force and coercion. There's a specialized kind of education that they're interested in. It can be provided by Indians. Conditions are very different. Phoenix Indian School is run by Indians now, too, but it's not bringing kids in from Alaska to separate them from their parents. Okay, the idea of a residential school, per se, is not malevolent or evil. The residential school could be, could be used in the ways we've described. It doesn't have to be. If Flandreau, well... Let's just say they're not teaching Indians to be proud of being Indians there. They're teaching Indians to be good Christians. And I got nothing much I want to say about Christianity per se, other than it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with Indian tradition, if you know what I mean. It has to do with somebody else's tradition. So if you're trying to Christianize people as a part of their so-called educational process, you're trying to turn them into something other than what they are. And when they talk about mainstreaming and uh, non-residential settings because is it, enough Indians have been run through this process to create a critical mass and it becomes cheaper to situate day schools on the reservation proximate. You don't have to have the geographic separation from parents that are already assimilated, you see. You can get that kind of reinforcement at home when you send them home at night and do it more cheaply. And you begin this process of what they call mainstreaming. But what exactly is the mainstream? You know that Indian tribe out there called mainstream? Oh, it has nothing to do. The mainstream is a settler society. That's just another euphemism or code word for taking Indian kids and convert them into functional ide ideological, intellectual, psychological white people, except they ain't white. And this society is still not quite so colorblind as it would like to make out in all of its enlightenment. We all know that. But ultimately, what you're doing is inculcating in that process a sense of self Self-demeanment, really, among the people who do not fit but are taught to aspire to an ideal, which is not really ideal. It's just a genetic condition to look a particular way, to fit a particular mode, to see the world in this way. The only reason for seeing the world this way rather than another way is that this way has announced itself to be superior to other ways. And it distorted the other ways to prove that point correct. So you got a very intricate process. You got a few Indian controlled schools out there that could serve as templates for an alternative to the sort of thing that I'm talking about, but that's not what people are talking about to this day as being good for Indians. Indians need to fit in. It's kind of like saying, if you think about it, the French needed to figure out how to fit into German society. The Indo-Chinese needed to figure out how to fit in with the French, and so on. For those of you who remember the notion of the third world, Algeria may be 
a superior example here because in order to retain Algeria in the face of international law requiring decolonization of Algeria, the French declared Algeria to be part of the home compartment. That is to be part of France itself. Yeah, so you had all these Algerians who were declared to be French, although self-evidently they weren't French in the sense the French understood Frenchmen. You know, the wages of that are still being played out in the streets of Paris and places to this day. But that's the nature of the thing. These other countries, and they are, by constitutional law in the United States, not to mention international law and indigenous law, Indians who are treated peoples have to be understood legally, not to mention culturally, politically, and otherwise, as countries separate from the United States. The United States cannot have, under its own constitution, treaties with them otherwise. And if you haven't got the treaties, you've got no title to the land base called the United States. So the treaties are necessary, and by virtue of the treaties, these are other countries, and these other countries are considered to be part of the United States. Nice little circularity of logic there. Exactly the same logic without the Mediterranean Ocean splitting the mother country from the colony that was applied by the French to Algeria to rationalize an absolutely illegal situation. Colonialism is illegal. There you have it. Well, Flandreau's to make that all seem okay. See, you can be as good as I am. <laughs> Why in the hell would I want to be like you? No offense, but I'll be myself, thank you. But that's the drill. We teach these kids they can be as good as their, what, betters? Yeah, right there. That's the nature of the good intention. That that good intention is anything but. I think you might have covered this, but this is a little nuance on that, I think. A little nuance, okay. Can you please speak on the impact of having native aunties and uncles, especially under the extended clan system, as caretakers of children in the boarding schools? Yeah, the question is, can I comment on the implications of having Indian aunties and uncles in a sense, extended family, clan system, you got some cognizance of that tradition and those relations. It's the implication of having the aunties and the uncles running the schools. Well, let me narrow it down a little closer than that in a society that understands nuclear family first and foremost, and that includes most native people at this point been indoctrinated to that view. Extended family doesn't function in most contexts, particularly in urban contexts. So you got, to set up our little scenario here, a mother and a father that have both come through residential schools and got together, the reason I t was talking about earlier, trying to find some sense of stability in their lives, something that's normal, and beget children. And then go through that pattern I'm talking about where the children are being subjected to the same treatment that the parents received in the schools and are being traumatized, victimized, and all the rest. The situation of these children is far worse. Why? Because whatever else could be said of what was going on in the residential schools, and I've said quite a lot about what was going on in residential schools, the people who were doing it were not literally their parents. Now it is. And when those kids fled those residential schools, they were trying to get home. They didn't always make it, but that was what they were trying to do, to get home. These kids now, in that condition, are running from home. Where do they go? Well, I can tell you where they go. You can go to Winnipeg, and you can see them on Maine. That's the largest urban concentration of Indians in North America. You've got an entire street that is Indian Skid Row. And Indian Skid Row exists precisely because of the induction of trauma that I'm talking about, okay? The spread of hopelessness that comes from that and you've got about a quarter of that population that is the resident, uh, the residents of that Main Street area in Winnipeg are kids under 15, runaways. You go to Vancouver, you're going to find them again. You go to Chicago, you're going to find them again. You'll find them here, too, if you know where to look. Not in as large a number as you're going to find in Winnipeg, but they're here. And you'll find them in every major urban area of the United States. And they haven't been relocated by government program like Indians were back in the 1970s. 
they got relocated as a consequence of a different government program. They relocated themselves to escape the conditions that were imposed upon their parents and transmitted to them. And that's one reason you have these extraordinarily high death rates among Indian adolescents. That, okay. Please tell me, if you can, why asking a Native American if they are full-blooded is offensive. Please uh, um, explain to me, if you can, why asking an American Indian if they're full-blooded could be considered offensive. Well, what are you asking, if I need a transfusion? Like I'm a pint short in my veins, or what are you asking? What, I got a pedigree slip like a poodle that says that I'm vetted to be worth more than the guy? What are you asking? How many white people we got in here? No white people in this whole room? Oh, that's a scary question coming. See, now I've set this up. Ooh, look at the, what happens when the shoe's on the other foot. Trauma setting in now? It's just a question. I'm not going to eat your liver. <laughs> or maybe I will. With what was that, fava beans in a fine Chianti? Oh, yeah. You saw that movie, too. Let's, let's try this again. How many white people we got in the room? If I asked more gently, look at that. Prove it. Come on. First volunteer, step up and offer me the evidence you actually are white. Now, I need your genealogy back to about 1770 with proof that you actually are not contaminated with something else. And do recall, this is a country with the one-drop rule. If you have any African ancestry at all, I don't care if it's back at the time the Cro-Magnons first invaded Europe, you're black. Now, how many white people do we have in this room? You recent immigrant? White is the state of mind. Yes, you're quoting me. Or if you're not, you should be, because I say that all the time. But we're not playing in that arena. We were talking about blood. That's the nature of the question. You defining me by blood, I'm going to return the compliment. Sure was. No, question was, why would asking if an Indian is full-blooded or what your blood fraction would be, why would that be considered offensive? For the same reason you're trying to get off the hook of defining your identity in terms of your blood quantum. It's your state of mind. Well, in a way, that's true. That's your allegiance, your orientation, your sense of self, your placement and relationship to other people. What society are you part of? What culture do you? Yeah, that's a state of mind, all right. But that's not the question posed to Indians. We're issued certificates of degree of Indian blood. That's an official government document. You're enrollable, recognizable, eligible, reviled, ridiculed on the basis of blood quantum, usually by white people. Interesting. Really interesting. Now, that's been part of the, the attacks on me over the last nine months. And it's obviously, I got a few white folks in the woodpile there somewhere, all right? Never denied it. Never maintained I was sitting bull. Okay? But to discredit me, they're going to prove I got no legitimate claim to be Indian. Well, on one drop rule, that would be a pretty hard one. But that doesn't apply to all racial groups. That just applies to certain racial groups. Now, certain racial groups, one, one drop will make you a part. And another, you've got to be a quarter or a half or whatever. Who's deciding these rules? Well, these guys, these white guys that want to take away your identity in order to discredit you and nullify your work. Isn't it interesting the worst thing they can think to call you is white? <laughs> yeah. Some really deformed sense of self-esteem and concept there, I'd say. Yeah, but... Kevin Flynn, who's uh, the prime actor in this, purports to be Irish. I asked him to prove that. He said couldn't do it because the English had control of the records. I said, see what I mean? He said, yeah, I'll take your point. Went right ahead and did it anyway. 
Yeah. So, really twisted. Now, be fair about it, I don't think he believes any of the stuff that he's been doing in order to try to make the preordained conclusion come true. He's just an attack dog, which is not a journalist, and you don't have much journalism left in this country, particularly when it's played this way. You could get it out of the Klan newspaper just as easily, but it's usually put more straightforwardly, which is to say, honestly, then the mainstream media will do it. But you still can't prove you're white. Not by these rules. Well, that's the rules that the question was framed in. Some days I think I'm black. That's my rules. And I'm going to stick to my rules and not let anybody change them. Me too, but they're not imposing a set of rules on you this way. Because it doesn't have to do with who you are. It has to do with somebody else's set of rules that allows them to name you. And in the process of naming you, assign your meaning. And in the process of assigning meaning, they assign value. So I can say, because of my hair. You can say what? So I, I can say, because of my hair, I have, because I do, I have Indian blood. Yeah. You can say what? Oh, no, you by definition, you're black. You clearly got one drop. And if you got one drop, you're black. Forget about it. Yeah. And that's, see, they want to play these games with documentary records. Those are the rules that assign what is put in the documentary records. You only get one race in this country up until the last 10 years. And if you got one drop of black blood, oh, let's make it a, a more reasonable fraction that we can actually quantify. If you are 1 16th black, Okay, and the rest of the admixture is Caucasian white. Okay, despite the fact that you're 15 16 white, you are listed as black. That 15 16 white just disappeared from the record. Well, that same set of rules applies to Indians. Indians tend to get listed as white when the admixture gets out to a certain point. But that doesn't mean the Indian part's not there. But now if you're going to go on the documentary thing, which is the game they've been playing with me, all those whites are really white. That's why I said, prove it. There's not many white folk that have been here more than four or five generations, or three or four generations, actually, who can actually make a claim by these rules to being white. You're going to be mixed with something else. Half those crackers wearing Klan robes in the cloud in the Klan down south are black, by law. By law, that's true. I think it's presumptuous of him to say that someday he feels black because you do have that choice and I don't Thank and you. she doesn't and he doesn't. You never thought that you were white? You never had a mindset that you were white, both of you? I don't have the choice. And it's not presumptuous at all. And you, you do have the choice. And if you don't think you have the choice, guaranteed you'll never have the choice. That's a very yeah. white Why way. would I want to be white? Okay. 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 That's a very white No, way. this is good. This is good. I want to. I agree. We need to stop it. We need to stop it. But it's good. Shows you exactly where it goes. Now this is the condition in Indian communities. Once you impose these external sets of criteria upon them and require adherence to them for purposes of identity, you create exactly the same sort of squabble. But now add a little money to destitute people into the pot, and you got continuous fractionalization, division, bitterness all the rest of it. And that's a means of incapacitating resistance, unity, continuity, preservation of culture, okay? But I gotta say something to you. And what you're saying is technically correct. If you can't envision it, you can't be it. If you can't see it, you can't do it. Okay, all that's true. The only thing is, the only people I've ever encountered who actively fantasize being whatever it is they want to be are white people, all right? <laughs> Yeah, you need to stop fantasizing about being something else and do something about what you are and what that implies, okay? That's a responsibility. If you think color has nothing to do with reality in this society, you must be white, okay? You've got to be white. Color has everything to do. This is the most color-oriented society that I could even conceive. You wouldn't have a clue what an Indian felt like, but let's shut down.
on that and go to something else. Um, just in the interest of uh, facilitating things not going on too long, I mean, Ward will be here after. He's going to be signing books. There'll be time for any kind of discussion you want to have. Um, but to wrap this up so that people who want to leave can leave and you can intermingle as you want to, I'm just going to do two more questions. Um, and so I'm just trying to pick out the ones that will sort of apply to the most people here and kind of continue into in the vein. So in your opinion, is there another colonial genocide and Holocaust happening to the Iraqi people perpetrated by the United States that is similar to what happened to the Native <coughs> Americans? Oh, yeah, well, I repeat them all. As long as someone reminds me by shouting, what you did, so here it comes. It, yeah, in your opinion, you're being me, is a Holocaust genocide, whatever term we're going to use, happening right now to the Iraqi people? And then there's a, another phrase which changes the answer, like happened to American Indians. So let me take that in two pieces. One, yes. That one's real simple. Okay? What's happening to the Iraqi people is genocidal in several ways, but I'll just stick to, to one that I think is real important to stick with because I keep trying to shuffle it out of sight, out of mind, and out of reality and existence altogether. And that is not, well, W has been waging his war or while his daddy was waging his war, but in between those two wars, when the sanctions were in place, the United Nations issued reports saying that by 1996, 565,000 Iraqi children under 12 years, I believe, under 12 years of age, had died needlessly. That is, as a result of the sanctions. Note, that's peacetime. The impact was more catastrophic then than during either of the wars. And I think you could maybe tally up both the wars and you're going to get a roughly equivalent number, and that's to the children that were being reported at that time. Now, those numbers have been challenged. First of all, note, that's a primary technique of neo-Nazi Holocaust deniers. Don't necessarily change or, or challenge the fact of what's happening, challenge the details of it. If you can get some murkiness on the details, then you can begin to chip away at the reality of the process itself. That's how they subvert it. Okay, the UN numbers were probably high. It seems to have encompassed just about every Iraqi child who died. Now, surely some of them would have died even without the sanctions. You would need to subtract those to have the needless deaths part. That's been parsed fairly closely in what the last I heard was a fairly right-wing source called Reason Magazine. All right? The big lie about the Iraqi children means that there were only 350,000. This is not some parallel to or similar to neo-Nazi-style Holocaust denial. That's the straight-up stuff. And the idea is that psychologically you're going to feel relief that only 350,000 as compared to 550,000 died. Excuse me. 350,000 needless child deaths as a result of the sanctions is a genocidal impact. You got that. And that was uh, on the American alternative to the Bushes. That was Bill Clinton. That was Madeleine Albright. Madeleine Albright who acknowledged the 565 and even if it had been that high a number, because she didn't know any different, that was the number that was on the table at the time. She went on 60 Minutes in 1996 and in an interview with Leslie Stahl acknowledged that she was aware of the number and that we, who exactly the we was she was referring to, I'm not entirely sure, but we had decided it's worth the price. Worth the price in someone else's babies. And somebody wonders why people fly planes in buildings in this country? Because that, she said on national TV, to virtually no response. There were people who responded, individuals, small organizations, marginalized and not part of the primary stream of opposition. There was no resonance in this country about that. Now there's a lot more happening at this point, obviously, and they're attacking the cultural institutions and the whole set of ways and means by which 
Iraqis understand themselves to be Iraqis. And that's a struggle because Iraq's a British invention, you know. But they're trying to do according to the rules, develop a national identity. The United States is coming in and redefining it for it. So you need to emulate the people who are slaughtering you. That's genocidal in itself. Yeah. When you attack the fundamental basis for the population to survive, as the United States has done, particularly in 91, when they bombed the water treatment facilities and the sewage facilities and all the rest of that, and that's what leads to the catastrophic death rates among the children. You are attacking not military targets, but the basis of the population itself to survive. That is not a legitimate, let's say, mode of warfare. That is genocide. These are class one war crimes. One last point on that. With that regard, you don't even need to go to genocide. Noam Chomsky's pointed out the fact that you have a war crimes act, federal act, it was put into place by federal by, excuse me, by Republican legislatures not that long ago. Now, they intended to use that as a basis of jurisdiction to prosecute high government officials in other countries for war crimes. But it couldn't frame it that way. It's applicable to U.S. officials as well. Under federal law, forget the laws of war and international law for a moment. Under federal law, George Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, we can keep taking them off, are subject to the death penalty. Okay? I'm not calling for the assassination of the president. I'm calling for law enforcement. I'm a good Republican. I want law enforcement. Yeah. To the gurney, George. So, um... Just as a lead up to this last question, because I know this is something people want to know about, I wanted to point out that there is a collection of Ward's books here, and there are actually many more. Ward continues to be a very prolific author. He also continues to be a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, despite the efforts of Bill O'Reilly and Lynn Cheney and other people in high positions in government who would like to see that not be true. So I really want to, uh, and I don't think that's because it's a fun thing. Ward is <laughs> continuing to do this. I mean, b being a teacher aside and how fun that is, but continuing to face what he's been facing in the onslaught, it would have been easier to step down in many ways and just step out and, and be a prolific author. But there are reasons that Ward is still involved, and I think that um, we all should do probably all of you who are here tonight feel grateful that Ward continues to fight this fight because it has ramifications that go far beyond him and clearly this is a campaign and this is a new way of being able to silence people. Trial by media is a lot easier and for them now than trial by a McCarthy commission because we've all learned that oh that's bad but trial by media there's there's nothing that's the free press. So. This question is, please give us an update of the tenure and your legal troubles in Colorado, et cetera. Oh, we're back to that, huh? Okay. Please, yep. Please give us an update on your uh, tenure and legal battles in Colorado. Well, let's see. They're try Actually, the blog attacks and so forth have gotten in their own way. All right. Some of you may know that I was taken under investigation by the University of Colorado administration in direct contradiction of its own rules, which says that under attack for exercising the academic freedom of framing speech, per se, you will have every defense possible put up of your right by the institution. The first thing that came up when the Republicans got upset with my analogy of the 911 victims in their, insofar as they were involved in the technocratic aspects of day-to-day -day activity in the World Trade Center to Eichmann, once that became a hot-button issue, and that's purely a speech issue, I was taken under investigation on the basis of my speech for the express intent of going through everything I'd ever written 
and every speech I'd ever given insofar as it was recorded to see if I had engaged in other speech activities which could serve as a basis for termination, abridging tenure, and all the rest on that basis alone. That was really an attempt to see if they could negotiate a buyout for me to split the difference in nice liberal fashion, the way Clark Kerr would have done across the bay, okay? We won't be conservative and we won't actually defend our principles. We'll see if we can find some sort of little subtle maneuver in the middle, okay? And I said, I'm perfectly viable. It's not about money. I'm of an age where I don't need to do this. I like to do it, it's my vocation, but here's my quid pro quo. You will vet the scholarship and you will reaffirm your commitment to academic freedom and you will do it in a public way. That's where it broke down. They would not reaffirm their own rules, which they'd already violated in the first place. So you got to really, I mean, it's elegantly framed commitment to the principle of academic freedom in the rules of the regions, or laws of the regions as they flatter themselves to call them in Colorado. Okay, which the first time they were tested, they did exactly the opposite of what they had dedicated themselves to do, and they refused to reaffirm. That's where we stand with that. Once I had taken that position, and they had decided they were going to take the entire system of tenure under review, so they weren't about to do that one, they decided that they needed to find a pretext to proceed because the heat was still on from the right. Incidentally, I registered as a Republican, so everything you're hearing from me is from a Republican source. Now, I speak for the Republican Party of Colorado tonight, all right? So a uh, good Republican position is this. We have to find some basis so they have uh, to <laughs> revoke tenure on the basis of academic misconduct, uh, research fraud. So they got a website from an unpublished assistant professor of sociology at Lamar University, you know, kind of the Harvard of Texas, <laughs> who had written a nine-page paper prospectus, is what he called it, uh, critiquing my contention that the Army deliberately infected Indians at Fort Clark in the upper Missouri River in 1837 with smallpox and in the ensuing pandemic, 100,000 or more people had died, uh, which incidentally is an idea he stole from Gunter Louis in Commentary Magazine about two months earlier without attribution, which according to AHA rules is plagiarism. So you got a plagiarized paper prospectus that was going to make this case against me for distortion of my sources to make this historical fabrication work, counting sources as being one. Scholarship was so tight, so abs tight, I guess, is a good word. Okay, this is such impeccable scholarship on assistant professor Brown's part that he missed the fact there were four footnotes. Okay, so on one quarter of the footnotes, he said that I had misrepresented the work of Russell Thornton and as regards demography, well, actually, all you have to do is take the list of peoples that Thornton attributed at smallpox fatalities resulting from Fort Clark to, okay, and do what he didn't do, which is go over and find the, the standard estimates of the number of those smallpox fatalities region and people by region and people, because he uses both regional estimates and particular people estimates. Okay, make a call on figures of that, add it up, and comes way over 100,000. 20,000 in coastal area Canada alone. Okay, California, hell, California, the estimates run as high as 300,000. They're not credible, okay, pair them back down. But when you're dealing with numbers like that, to suggest that 100,000 people died in the ensuing pandemic is probable is not to misstate Thornton at all, aside from which my second source, which was Evan Connell out here, just says flatly 100,000 people died as a result of it. Brown didn't have that. Now, some Marxist in New York by the name of Louis or Louis Proyek pointed out to the fact you, you said one source and he's got four. So he immediately changed it to four sources and didn't credit Proyek either. So plagiarism number two, okay? 
but he couldn't abandon the position he already had, so he had to pretend that Connell didn't say what he, I keep going with this. I'm on an academic uh, misconduct charge, research fraud charge on this basis. And I actually, kind of in a backhanded way, want to thank them for doing that, because I never really dealt with Fort Clark in any depth. If you look at what all this is about, it's three paragraphs out of about 12,000 pages of published material where I mentioned Fort Clark in passing. I've now gone back and looked at it and, oh, it's lots worse than I thought. Okay. So they'll be published by my editor here at City Lights, a full-blown essay dealing with the Fort Clark smallpox pandemic right out of the archival records, which are not represented in the conventional literature particularly well at all. They missed a lot of stuff, I've found. Beginning with question with regard to the United States Army, which my initial position was, maybe I should have put that a little differently. I said it was the Army, it was the War Department. Now, I always thought the War Department had something to do with the Army, but, well, it was, in fact, the Army. There was a War Department policy put out by Lewis Cass six years before this that said under no circumstances will you inoculate the Indians upriver on the Missouri River. That's withholding vaccine, which is what I said. But it wasn't with regard just to the Mandans. It was re with regard to all the upriver up peoples. Okay, with the explicit objective of seeing what smallpox might do to weaken the power of the Blackfeet Confederacy. It weren't after the Mandans per se, but the Mandans were just fine. And the Mandans, contra Brown, were not considered to be a friendly people. It's right there in the record that they were considered by the U.S. to be hostile, thus to be denied smallpox vaccine. I think that's what I said about Fort Clark, actually. But we're going to go through this whole dog and pony show procedure. We've got another from a relatively actually the guy's got six published pieces down at university of new mexico two of them are devoted to me so i'm one thirty of his academic career thus far <laughs> to prove that under the general allotment act indian identification wasn't a matter of something imposed by the federal government the federal government no, had no alternative to, but to apply a race code to indians because the indians demanded it that's the, the substance of the argument there. I mean, these are like swatting flies in the end, if you ever get a chance to get to the fly. All right, but you've got all this bureaucratic nonsense to tie you up, preempt you from doing your work, more constructive work, to where you're going to get tired of it and go away. That's the plan. They forwarded the charges as far as the point of determining that they wanted to investigate. They can't back off, they can't stop, so they have to continue to go forward. They've dropped a whole bunch of this stuff along the way, simply not being sustainable. The issues on identity, the issues on copyright, and so on and so on and so on have already been dropped. We're down to the sorts of things I'm talking about. They tried to form a committee to be the investigative panel. Now, although I had 400 plus newspaper articles devoted to me, my case, and parsing it in barely 60 days in the Denver metro area, which is an unprecedented amount of exposure, trying to obliterate me simply by media offensive to see if that would work. It didn't. But in the meantime, arguably, you've contaminated the whole jury pool, if you want to frame it that way. There's nobody in that area can be unaffected by this. I made that argument, said you need to get an entirely external committee. They named three people for, that are internal nonetheless all of whom are white, none of whom know anything in particular about the subject matters at issue. They thought perhaps they should add to external people, both to kind of mitigate the jury contamination issue and possibly to get somebody in there who wasn't white and maybe even somebody who knew something about the relevant areas of law and history that are at issue. As Soon as they did that, the attack dogs on the right went after them. And 48 hours of concentrated blog blitz, smearing their personal reputations, personal lives, and so on. They just said, kiss my ass and left. We don't need this. You know, this isn't a process of vetting scholarship. This is insanity. Well, now they can't form a committee to all appearances as a result of that. Who in their right mind is going to step up to the plate for this kind of abuse? And for what? But absent the committee, 
they can't consummate the process. That's what I mean. The attack dogs sort of got in their own way here. That's where it stands right now. But this will be fought out step by step for as long as it takes. With the irony that I might well decide I had other things to do in life if they weren't messing with me. But as long as they're messing with me like this, they can be guaranteed I'm not going anywhere. Thank you all for coming. Um, just want to remind you that Kill the Indian, Save the Man, Ward's latest book with City Lights. We have a big pile of them here. If you're interested in talking to Ward some more, we'll be here for a while and have him sign a book. Be sure to buy one on your way out. Continue to support the independent presses and independent bookstores and yes. Ward Churchill and his big royalty check from us. Thank you very much. Now, yeah. thank you all. First, I got to sort of affirm something she said in a weird way. It's really dangerous for me to come out here. That's really why I didn't come, because every time I do, I end up spending my next two paychecks on books and have so much ballast I can barely take off from San Francisco Airport. Let me be a role model. All right. I'm sure they appreciate the sales. Other thing is, I've been standing here this long and playing by San Francisco rules, which means engaged in the absolutely uncivilized fashion of refraining from smoking inside a smoke bowl. Okay. So, first, before we get into interior interactions, the elite will meet on the street for a cigarette, okay, and then I'll return. Okay? Fair enough. You're watching a holiday edition of Book TV on C-SPAN 2, an extra 24 hours of programming about nonfiction books. Next, a Lincoln Forum event featuring Jay Winnick on his book, April 1865. That's followed by author Stephen Watts on the life and times of Henry Ford, and later a book about problems facing the global economy.